Okay, today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to read you some things that I think are very interesting from research I did on using charcoal as a soil amendment in America and Europe in the 19th century. So I was researching apples one day and I found some account of using charcoal as a soil amendment in an old publication from the 1800s and I thought, well that's interesting, I should search for more of those. So I did. I think I searched charcoal as a fertilizer or charcoal as fertilizer. And I came up with all kinds of stuff uh, from, you know, Google Books search result and I copied down all the most interesting parts and published them some years ago on my blog, which you can go read and I'll leave links all over for that. So what I'm reading today is just some little snippets that I think are very interesting. This information was the thing that really got me fired up, lit a fire under my ass to really start making a ton of charcoal and setting up a bunch of experiments. And to date, it's still the most compelling information I've found um, on the use of charcoal as a fertilizer. And it's still like my inspiration to keep uh, doing this. Uh, that and also the terra preta soils in the Amazon, which are you know human modified soils with a large proportion of charcoal that are hundreds and hundreds of years old and are still much more fertile than the surrounding soils. There's a lot of uh, new science on biochar. There's a lot of people doing research and working on that. But, you know, it's all short-term results. The interest in it is new. There's very few long-term results. And really, soil and, far and gardening, these are such complicated systems that we can't really understand them completely anyway. And if the more you try to divide things into really myopic, ex, you know, scientific experiments and control everything, the more abstracted you get from reality. And, you know, the, in the ground war of farming and gardening, what matters is does it work, does it not? And that's why I'm really interested in these accounts is they were just people making observations and, and using the stuff and seeing what happened. And um, the ones that are most interesting are the long term, you know, the long term ones to me. So that's what we're doing today. I'm going to read some stuff. I'll probably cut in some pictures so you don't have to just sit here and watch me read. Okay, this is uh, probably my favorite, most interesting one. And I'm going to summarize the first two paragraphs because I think uh, it'll just help set the story up better. Uh, comparative merits of charcoal and barnyard manure as fertilizers. This is from the Farmer's Cabinet and American Herd Book, Volume 11, 1847. So basically this guy's father bought a farm in 1788. The practice back then was often to just move into a piece of land. You wouldn't fertilize it, you'd just farm it because the soils were new, virgin rich soils. This is like, you know, the settling of America. And they would just use the soil up and then move to a new spot. In this farm, they had a barn and they didn't even bother to spread the manure from the barn on the fields. They just left it in the barn. It was like several feet thick. So the land was exhausted. So they moved the barn because they wanted to use that part as a field. And he observed over 17 years that he lived there, the fact that the, you know, you could see the spot where the barn was because it was so fertile because of all this manure that was left there. And over that 17 years, he saw the fertility of the barn site decline. Now on the same land, they were also burning charcoal previously. Now people would burn charcoal in these pits. You dig a pit and you put the wood in and then you like build a mound of dirt over the top of it, burn it for several days, and then that was a way that people cleared their land, and then you could sell the charcoal to, you know, the local refinery or a blacksmith or whoever used it. And you typically would burn a pit once and then move because it's easier to dig a new pit than it is to uh, move all that wood to the old pit. So the landscape, you know, in a lot of areas that used to be forested and were cleared are spotted with these, you know, charcoal pits. So after he had lived there for a while, he left and he came back, and this is his account of coming back. On revisiting the neighborhood in the autumn of 1817, I carefully examined the corn crops then standing upon the spot and was unable to discover the slightest difference in the growth or product upon that and other parts of the field. This was about 28 years after the removal of the barn. Upon the same farm and upon soil every way inferior were the remains of several pit bottoms where charcoal had been burned before the recollection of any person now in the vicinity and most probably judging from appearances between the years of 1760 and 1770. These pit bottoms were always clothed when in pasture with a luxuriant covering of grass and when brought under tillage with heavy crops of grain. Eleven years ago I pointed out these facts to the present occupant and his observations since coincide with my own previously made, that they retain their fertility very little impaired, a period probably of about 70 or 80, certainly not less than 65 or 70 years. Here then is an excellent opportunity of observing the comparative value of charcoal and barnyard manures as a fertilizer of lands. 
The former has not, after at least 60 or 70 years exposure, exhausted its powers of production, while the latter lost its influence entirely in 28 years and most probably in much less time. I have since had many opportunities of observing the effects of charcoal left in pit bottoms upon vegetation, one of which only I will relate. The last season in the northern part of Ohio was one of uncommon frost and drought. In May, the wheat fields, when promising a luxuriant crop, were cut off by frost, especially in the valleys, and very much injured in the highlands, which was succeeded by the most severe drought ever experienced in the west. The wheat which escaped both these scourges was afterwards very much injured by rust, Near the village of Canton, upon a farm on high ground which had been mostly cleared of its timber by its conversion into charcoal, it was observed that upon the old pit bottoms the wheat grew very luxuriantly, was clear of rust, and had ripened plump in the berry, while in the adjacent parts of the field it was short in growth, the stem blackened with rust, and the berry light and shriveled. Charcoal as a Fertilizer, The New Jersey Farmer, Volume 2, Number 1, September 1856. For two years past I have used 50 loads each of refuse charcoal and being fully convinced that it pays I wish to recommend it to my brother farmers. I have tried it on grass, corn, and potatoes, have tried it alone and in the compost heap, and in all situations it has proved faithful to its trust. As a top dressing for grass it gives a green color and a luxuriant growth. Applied to half an acre of early potatoes the last summer, the yield was 75 bushels of as fine and healthy potatoes as could be desired that sold readily for $1 per bushel and yielded the most profit of anything else raised on the farm. It absorbs from the air those gases offensive to the nostrils but the main food of plants, and this it will do not once only or for one season but very possibly for a century. Where an old coal pit has been burnt the land never seems to wear out. The first settlers point to the coal bottoms that are 50 years old still by their exuberant vegetation marking well the spot where wood was converted into charcoal. Alright so this one is uh, someone writing from England. Uh, about uh, using charcoal on the wheat crop in France. We have been astonished at the enormous increase of the wheat crop in France within the last eight or ten years and have devoted some attention to the investigation of the subject. It appears that charcoal, an article that can be obtained here for a tithe of its cost in France, has been extensively used and with marked effects in fertilizing the wheat lands of that kingdom. A correspondent of the New Farmer's Journal, in English print, states that during a sojourn in one of the central departments of France, he learned that some of the most productive farms were originally very sterile, but that for a number of years their proprietors had given them a light dressing of charcoal, which had resulted in a large yield of wheat of excellent quality. Since his return to England, he has tried the experiment upon his own lands with the same happy effect. The charcoal should be well pulverized and sown like lime after rain or still damp day. Even in England, the writer says, the expense is a mere trifle in comparison with the permanent improvement effected, which on grass is truly wonderful. He states one other very important result from its liberal use. I am quite satisfied that by using charcoal in the way described, rust and wheat will be entirely prevented, for I have found in two adjoining fields, one which was cold and the other manured with farmyard dung, the latter was greatly injured by rust, while that growing in the other was perfectly free from it. Okay, The Ohio Cultivator, Volume 3, Number 1, 1847. Sometime since there was an inquiry in your paper respecting the use of charcoal as a fertilizer. I have one word to offer on the subject, which is this. Some 15 or 20 years since, while owned by another individual, there was much coal burned on my farm while in the act of clearing the land. The land since that time has undergone much tilling, with little or no manure, not much rest until lately, and notwithstanding the time that has elapsed, the places where the coal pits were burned produce the best crops of every kind. I am so much pleased with it that I wish my farm was covered in three or four inches thick of pulverized charcoal. I think the benefits of it could never be exhausted. This is from 12 Lectures on Agricultural Topics, 1871. We have all noticed that where a charcoal pit has been burned, the soil remains good for a long time. On the mountains of Berkshire, we have seen white clover growing luxuriantly on the bed of an old charcoal pit, making an oasis in the desert of ferns and briars that surrounded it. On inquiry, we found that the coal pit must have been burned half a century ago. On digging into this soil, we discovered little, if any, appearance of decay and promising to do good service for half a century more. This is from an American traveling in China, Commercial Relations of the United States with Foreign Countries, 1872. The first day of our trip, we saw the farmers engaged in burning stalks of millet and so on in heaps of earth as is done in the manufacture of charcoal, in order, we suppose, to bring out their fertilizing properties. It is very likely, then, that in China they have known the value of charcoal as a fertilizer long before us, its use for that purpose being among us of a recent date. American Wheat Culturist, 1868. 
Every observing farmer who has been accustomed to raise wheat cannot have failed to notice the luxuriant growth of cereal grain round about the places where charcoal has been burned even more than 30 or 40 years ago. The growing stems of wheat that are produced on such old charcoal beds are seldom affected with rust, and besides this, the straw is always much stiffer than that which grows where there is not a dressing of charcoal. Okay, now from the same publication. The field was sown with barley in the spring previous, yield small, 18 bushels per acre. I turned in the stubble the last week in August, harrowed it over, then took about 18 bushels of charcoal crushed fine and top dressed a strip through the middle of the acre over about one third of its length. I then broadcast my wheat and harrowed it over twice. The result was the heads when ripe were at least twice as long as where no coal was put on. I harvested all together, the yield was 43 bushels. I think by applying 50 bushels of coal to the acre as a top dressing made fine by grinding in a common bark mill, it would increase the yield at least 400% if the soil is poor. Now, uh, remember, in a lot of these cases, this was waste charcoal, and they were getting it from places that maybe burned charcoal, and they would end up with large piles of powder that they couldn't use, and uh, you could haul it away for cheap or free. Now, that's different than using really fresh burned charcoal, because as the charcoal is exposed to the environment, it absorbs uh, gases and becomes what people call charged. So if you take raw charcoal and use it directly, it often will actually sap nutrients from the soil. And I've experienced that myself. It's a well-known effect. But a lot of these guys were using old powdered leftover charcoal that it could have been sitting around for years. Okay, this one's pretty interesting. In the midst of the disastrous drought of last summer, while crossing a field in Mariah occupied by Mr. Richmond, I observed a lot with its surface deeply and singularly blackened. Upon inspection, I found it thickly strewn with pulverized charcoal. The field presented a rich verdure, that means it was really green, strongly contrasting with the parched and blighted aspect of the adjacent country. The following details of this experiment, supplied at my request, attest to the value of this material as a fertilizing principle. Okay, so this is a quote from the guy who, whose field this was. The soil is loamy. The charcoal was applied on four acres of dry land and on one acre of moist soil by top dressing. The amount used was about 1,000 bushels to the acre, spread on so as to make the surface look black, but so as not to encumber or obstruct vegetation. It was applied in September and October 1850 at an expense by contract of $40. It was procured at a furnace from a mass of pulverized charcoal left as useless and was drawn one mile and a half. The effect was immediate. The grass freshened and continued green and luxuriant after the surrounding fields were blackened by the early frosts. Although the last season had been so unfavorable for vegetation, Mr. Richmond realized one-third more than the ordinary yield of hay and sufficient to repay the whole outlay. He thinks that he cut nearly double the quantity of grass on this lot than he did upon any similar meadow on his farm, and that the quality of the hay is improved. I began the use of it in the year 1846 and first employed it as a top dressing on a strong clay soil, which was plowed in the fall of 1845. I spread on about 15 wagon loads of the dust to the acre after the wheat had been sowed and harrowed one way. I was surprised to find my crop a heavy one compared with my neighbors raised on the same kind of land. The wheat was of better quality and yielded four or five bushels extra to the acre. I have since used it on similar land, sometimes mixed with barnyard manure and sometimes alone, but always as a top dressing, usually on land seeded for meadow. The results were always the most favorable. I find my land, thus seeded, produces more than an average crop of hay and always of the finest quality. I have also used the dust on loamy and interval land with the potato crop. During the series of years in which the rot almost ruined the potato crop, I scarcely lost any potatoes from that cause and supposed it was owing to the coal dust I used. My manner has been to drop the seed and cover it with a small shovel full of dust and then cover it with earth. In this way, I've used all the coal dust I have been able to save from the coal consumed in a forage of five fires, and which amounts to about 250 loads per year. Wow, he's lucky. He probably got that for free, too. In the colder regions of the Adirondacks, charcoal dust has been used with great advantage. The note of Mr. Ralph presents the experiment in the following language. Mr. Ralph. As a top dressing for meadows, charcoal dust and the accumulation of ashes and burnt left over on old charcoal pit bottoms have been used here with remarkable results. And I judge from the trials which have been made that this application has added at least one third to the hay crop where it has been used. It was remarked during the past very dry season, when vegetation was almost burnt up by the long continued drought, that those fields which had been dressed with the substance were easily distinguished by their rich green of their herbage.
The Plow, the Loom, and the Anvil, Volume 2, 1849. What a cool name for a publication, right? His trial on a field of four acres with potatoes in 1847 was very remarkable. They were planted in ridges, or as termed here, lazy beds. One half the field manured with farmyard manure, and the other with peat charcoal only. About a handful thrown on each seed. The result was more than a double crop from the charcoal, and he informed me that he was himself so astonished at the fact that he requested Lord Donegal to see and vouch it. At my suggestion, he planted oats the next year on the whole field without any further manure, and he assured me the increase on that proportion manured with charcoal was nearly in the same ratio as the potatoes. In February last, he planted a large field in drills, manured as usual, not then having charcoal. But in April he got some, and before the potatoes were earthed up, he top-dressed a few yards at the foot of all the drills as far as he had charcoal. He authorizes me to state that the result was not only very nearly a double crop, but that there was not a taint in one of them while all the rest of the field was more or less diseased. I must tell you his reply to my inquiry as to his experience of its value for grassland. He said, Nothing can exceed it, and there is little or no labor in using it. My friend Fenwick swears by it, and he declares he will write his name on the best grass in the country with black charcoal, and will be the greenest part of the field in 10 days. Okay, that's it. You can go read the rest of it online if you want. I'll leave links all over the place, and, you know, here and there. And somebody, please, go find these sites. In some of these accounts, they have names, townships, uh, physical descriptions of locations, there are charcoal pits scattered all across the east and midwest. That would be fascinating. That, to me, that's like the most compelling, interesting research that could be done on biochar right now is going and finding more old sites. And here are the clues right here. And what, what could be more fun than sleuthing up these old sites and um, checking them out? That could be, pfft. yeah. I can't do it. I'd like to. All right, I'm going to go burn some charcoal because it, in spite of the fact that it's June, it is raining and um, I can actually burn charcoal today and it's probably my last chance this season until it rains in the fall.